Good morning, everyone. We're in the very last couple of days of our salient characteristics of Paramahansa Yogananda, and we're up to number 31. And there's only 32, so by the end of this week, we'll have to find something else to talk about. But for the moment, we have two more days, so let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your living presence within our hearts, that we may know in every moment that we are not alone, but you are guiding and blessing us, leading us out of delusion and into the light. Give us the clarity and the courage to respond to that call and to live our lives as you intended with ever deepening devotion and ever greater freedom in thee. Om peace. Amen. So my friends, Swami writes, physically speaking, I was impressed by Master's, by Master's posture. It was always firmly upright. Somehow it was evident to me that his consciousness was always centered both in the spine and at the point between the eyebrows. And there's just, there's a lot of implications to that which are very interesting um, in, in the Mahabharata and to an extent in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, there are parts of it in there. Um, you have Arjuna, who is the devotee, and you have Krishna, who is his charioteer, who is the Lord himself. And Arjuna has all this power to fight, and he, his, uh, his weapon was the bow and arrow. And when they talk about um, Arjuna, the, the dialogue in the Bhagavad Gita, which is in the middle of the Mahabharata epic, which is the story about this great war, which is, was actually a physical, historical event, and is also the inner battle that we all face, the battle of consciousness, to have right consciousness. And Arjuna becomes discouraged, unnecessarily discouraged, meaning there was no foundation for his discouragement, no enduring foundation for his discouragement, and the whole conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, which is the Bhagavad Gita, is Krishna making it clear to Arjuna that he must fight the battle, he can fight the battle, and he will be triumphant in this battle. And the whole story is how the devotees begin to feel that we, um, I'm going to have to pause for a moment, fight the battle, but when he becomes discouraged, he becomes discouraged and he unstrings his bow. And of course, unstringing the bow, if you're a warrior, means that you're not going to use it anymore to shoot the arrows and fight the battle. But the symbolic explanation to unstring the bow, the, the bow represents the human body, which is the spine, the straight spine, and then the curving uh, front of the body. I mean, whether you're um, obese or slender, nonetheless, the front of the body curves, and the back of the body is perfectly straight. So when he unstrings the bow, he collapses. Just hit, hit, that's what that means. He collapses. The power of the spine is lost in discouragement, and he collapses. And uh, for those of you who are looking at this as a film and not just listening to it, you know, when I drop my head down and drop my shoulders down, sitting in my, the chair where I sit, you know, I would only sit like this if I were really um, discouraged about something. I can feel it. It feels, it feels like a very sad posture to me. And then when things look better, I pull my shoulders back and I straighten my spine. All of us do this if we think about it. And when you look at people, that even people you don't know, you can often tell a lot about who they are by how they carry their spine. Now, I mean, of course, sometimes people have physiological reasons why um, the body is not as stalwart or straight, but 
most of the changes that people make to their body are changes of consciousness. I had a very sort of fun time once looking in the mirror at my own face and just imagining different states of mind, you know, just habitual sadness, habitual anger, habitual anxiety, sort of like what, what, was, what does the face do when you're worried all the time or when you're angry or when you're sad? Even when I just make my face sad, I feel my spine curves forward. This is sort of the body itself is an extension of our consciousness. And when I was looking at my face, I could see how many different possibilities there, there are with just exactly the same features and how very, very different and the, the same face could appear over time. There's an, a, a saying that says, up until the age of 40, you have the face that God gave you. After the age of 40, you have the face you make for yourself. So it's just one of those things. But there is a lot of truth in it, that we begin, our bodies begin to reflect whatever the hab- habitual vibration that has gone through it. So part of that then is you can figure out who you are or you can figure out who other people are partly by looking at their bodies. Whenever I see someone who has a, not whenever, but often when I've seen someone who has a notable a way of carrying their body, a way of walking or a way of standing, sometimes not in front of them, but I'll put my body into that same position and just sort of see what kind of consciousness would bring about that way of walking or that way of standing. Often you can gain, I can gain, help, very helpful insights about what a person's essential reality is by watching how their body, how they carry their body. Um, so the, the reverse of that is that we can also affect our consciousness through the physical body. This is the whole premise of yoga postures, um, which is more than just exercising the body for aerobic fitness. Yoga postures use the relationship between consciousness and physical expression by deliberately assuming certain physical expressions so as to influence our consciousness. Because consciousness is harder to get your hands on. But you can use your legs and your arms and your chest and your shoulders to imitate sort of what would I do if my consciousness were a certain way. And then let's say in this case a desirable kind of consciousness. This is what I would do. So if I consistently bring my body back to that state of consciousness, it, will, it, it has a very strong and positive effect on our consciousness because, you know, just like every time in this little brief conversation with you that I'm wanting to talk about being discouraged and I drop my shoulders and pull my heart in, it, it, it's, it's very uncomfortable to me. And it's not uncomfortable in a physical sense, it's, it's uncomfortable in a psychological sense. So when we can train ourselves that way, it's, it's surprisingly powerful. And of course, we can look at the, at the saints and at the masters because their bodies spontaneously express the consciousness that of, the, of a higher, higher understanding. Ananda Ma, who had a, a most unusual life, she's the joy-permeated mother that Master talks about in Autobiography of a Yogi. And she never... Um, really had a, a sadhana in the same way that, um, that Master describes. Although there was a period of time in Ananda Moy Ma's life where she um, deliberately assumed a thin veil between herself and her higher consciousness so she could have the experience of sadhana, which is the experience of doing disciplined, disciplined spiritual practices in order to change her consciousness. But from a young age, she would just spontaneously um, have, have uh, expressed spiritual, uh, spiritual bhavs. And there was a period of time when her body just assumed yoga postures. It, she did not deliberately do it. The energy flowed through her, and the quality of the energy was to assume certain classic postures because she was in that vibration and that's what, that's what a body would do when you were in that vibration. It's extremely 
interesting from this perspective. Swami Kriyananda, many of you knew him at the end of his life or perhaps never met him at all. By the end of his life, the, um, the wear and tear on his physical body had, uh, had worn the machine out a little bit. So he, didn't, he, was, he was more emaciated um, and just not, not quite as stalwart as he had been. But for most of the years that I knew him, his, he, he, he dramatically demonstrated the idea of a bow as being the form of the physical body. And when you looked at Swami from the side, he had an absolutely straight spine, always. Just straight, ready, strong. And then the front of his body curved outward. And what was so interesting, I realized when I looked at him uh, from the side, and well, this I'll take it a step back. I have a, a, an active mind, and I have a verbal mind, and I, I've, I enjoy intelligence is the, way, the only way I can think to put it. It's kind of a hobby of mine. It's just sort of, I like, I like what the mind can do, a bright mind. I like what it can do, how it can think about things and say things and know things. And Swami had the same hobby. He was a writer, after all, and a speaker. But his intelligence was of, of such a different order of magnitude than my own or that of anyone I knew. And because of the way I grew up, I, I was often surrounded by people who had very bright minds. And some of my a few close friends of mine were really extraordinarily bright. My own brother was a very, very uh, intelligent person, is. And uh, my parents. But Swami, as I said, was another order of magnitude. And it, it, it just like his insightfulness, like what we were talking about yesterday, Swami's insightfulness on any subject and his ability to resolve issues, to find solutions where, where it was just the rest of us who were not, not dumb by any means, just couldn't find our way out of situations sometimes. And Swami would just look at it and he would just point the, the most obvious solution that none of us had thought of until he brought it forward. So I used to actually, I would just ponder, like, what is the secret of his extraordinary, extraordinary ability, you know, to see clarity and truth in situations where others have difficulty? Then I, now I'm coming back to, to his posture. And a Master has a statement that reason follows feeling which is a very, very interesting thing to contemplate, which is if you, are, if you have a feeling orientation, if you are, if you have, um, if you are leaning a certain way in your feelings, then your thoughts will support those feelings. Now, if your feelings are deeply centered in superconscious awareness, that becomes the heart and the mind working in perfect sync. If the feelings are oriented toward emotions, toward desires, toward maintaining um, limited attachments, then reason can be, often be very tricky because reason will just find justifications. This is how very intelligent people for example, in what happened in the Second World War with the Nazi regime, many of those people were brilliant, highly educated, refined, you know, art, music, everything that you would consider. And yet, they were able to embrace a, a, a diabolical um, orientation toward the Jewish people and a diabolical justification for absolute barbarism because there was an emotional prejudice in favor of creating a scapegoat and getting personal power. So it was, they had it all reasoned out, because reason follows feeling. Um, it, it's, it's worth contemplating. So I finally understood that the clarity of Swamiji's mind was because of the courage and the clarity of his heart which was that Swami was not afraid of the truth. 
He was eager to know the truth. He was not afraid to know it. Whatever it might, whatever cherished preferences it might demolish, whatever the implications of it were, he, his, his single interest was always what is true. He, would, he, he was able to accept reality with a calm courage that was unprecedented in my experience, unique in my experience. And then I finally come back to the straight spine and the bow, the way he looked from the side. Now, um, my orientation, and this is a, a physical challenge that I've had to work with over the course of my life, my orientation was always first in my brain, in the frontal lobe, the reasoning power of my brain. And I literally leaned forward so that when I would face life, the first thing that would be out there would be the, from my frontal lobe. I would be pushing with my brain. Whereas when I looked at Swami, the first thing that would meet the world was his heart. Because his, it's part of, you see, this is, now this is a very interesting thing. If you look at just the physiology of it, the structure, the, when people try to straighten their spine, like, you know, when they don't have a habit of a straight spine, often people try to straighten their spine by lifting up their shoulders or by tightening their back, something like that, which doesn't create what Swami is talking about in Master. But if you lift your heart, if you lift your heart toward the spiritual eye, not the spiritual eye in the forehead, but the light that you see when you meditate. When, when we teach people to meditate, the, the, I mean, just of the many images, the position of the eyes is also extremely critical to your state of consciousness. The th three, three states of consciousness, three positions of the eyes. When the eyes drop below the horizon, that's what we're doing when we fall asleep. As a public speaker, speaker I have watched adults fall asleep more than most people get to do. <laughs> because I would often teach in the evening and people had had a long day at work. So I would watch people fall asleep and their eyes would gradually drop the poor dears. And you know, it would just happen like that. And then they'd try to wake up again. When your eyes are straight forward, when you're trying to concentrate and just see something, you, look, you peer very intently with, the, with horizontal eyes right at the horizon line. When we're trying to get inspiration, we lift our eyes just above the horizon. So you meditate with closed eyes, but the inner position of the physical eye is to be raised above the horizon line, but not cross-eyed. Um, Lahiri Mahashaya meditated with eyes half open, half closed. But that's, that's hard for most people to do. Most people find it easier to close the eyes and block out all physical images. But if you, I, I suggest to people that if you're standing on a balcony and there's a high mountain range in front of you and you're looking up to the top of the mountain, the eyes naturally assume the position. And if you put your hand out in front of you, um, the point at which the two eyes meet is sort of where the resting point is. We do it naturally. The eyes are raised like that. We're looking just above the horizon line. And then you close your eyes and... With that relaxed position, the light of the spiritual eye will sometimes, not for everyone, but some kind of light will appear there. Well, in that same physical relationship, if you, if you lift your heart up into that light, which again, these are things that happen to you spontaneously. If you're looking at the sunrise um, over the mountain, coming up over the mountain, once in my life, or several times in my life, I've been in Darjeeling, and I've gone up to a lookout point and watched the sun come up over the, over the high mountain there, the, the Himalayas there. I can't remember which mountain it is, but it's a well-known mountain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're watching it with your eyes, but your heart is just mm -hmm. going up to that extraordinary scene. Well, that's, that's what, that creates right posture. Because right posture, the, the spine straightens when the heart opens. So open our hearts, open and lift your heart, and then your posture assumes what it's supposed to assume. Because 
that's the flow of consciousness that we want. And then the, the, the brain is there, but it's not dominating. And it's interesting, a lot of times when the habitual posture is the, the shoulders rolled forward, what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to protect the heart. At least that's how it feels to me. And so we, we, we try to literally try to draw the, the heart you know, closer to the back, roll the shoulders over just to protect it because it's very tender. And then we might also add this forward-leaning gesture so that we can keep the reason and the brain ahead of the feelings. But when all of that comes to peace, then heart and mind work in perfect harmony because wisdom, both are needed. True wisdom requires both reason and feeling being held in balance. This is the yin-yang that we're always working for, the perfect circle created by the two halves. So now Swami takes one more, I mean more than one, but he also talks about how the fact that Master lived in the spine. Master's consciousness was centered in the spine. Now the, the spine is where the chakras are located and the, 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 the kundalini energy flows and it's the um, exhalation and inhalation are the physical manifestations of the energy that's moving through the chakras, bringing energy to the spiritual eye, taking the energy from the spiritual eye and, and uplifting and inspiring all of the activities that the chakras carry out. The entire process of spiritual life is to with, withdraw our self-definition from all of this material manifestation, this ever-changing up and down duality that is this world. Instead of defining ourselves by that duality, we move deeper and deeper to the origin point where all that energy comes from, which is within us, within the spine, in this flow of energy, which is guided and centered at the spiritual eye. When we give our classes on the chakras and so on, which are easily accessible to you through the classes I've given on the YouTube channel and Ananda's classes everywhere, we, we, we really learn about how the energy in the chakras is what determines, it's, it's actually who we are is, is the vibration of energy in the chakras and the, the strength and the focus of that energy flowing through the, the spine. Swami talks about it like if you have a hose and you have the water th flowing through it, it's like if you want to water a plant and you have that hose and the water is just flowing out and you just keep batting at the water with your hand, trying to direct it where you want to direct it, that is how, with all due respect, a lot of people live. The energy just flows out of them. They just sort of bat it with their hands, trying to make it go where they want it to go. And, you know, you can make some things happen, but it's not a very efficient way to direct that energy. So the energy, our life force, runs through the center of us. But if you have that hose and if you can hold the hose and direct it, and even more if you can put your hand on the nozzle where the water is controlled, then you can really take that energy and use it in a constructive way to nourish whatever you want to nourish. But you have to be at the origin point in order to do that. So spiritual life is about pulling our self-definition away from this ever-fluctuating world and, and having our sense of of who we are emanate from our origin points, which is essentially the spine and the spiritual eye. Now, Master, this is simply who he was. He knew, he knew it was a, a, a fact for him, not a theory, not an intellectual idea. He knew that he was the inner flow of energy, and that energy was emanating from the divine, and that energy was... Uh, controlled and directed from divine awareness. So that's simply where he lived. And that didn't mean that he didn't reach out with that energy all the way to the, you know, the tiniest part of creation. Swami used the phrase, 
To be infinite also means to be infinitesimal, which is just really a beautiful way to say it. If you're omnipresent, if you're everywhere, that means that you're in the grain of sand, in the little sparrow. The, you know, the sparrow falls not without my sight. I see the, the infinite sees everything because we're at the origin point from which it all begins, the, the light that then creates all of this. So in, in a human way, one of the many ways that we can keep ourselves reminded of this is how we hold our physical body. Because how we hold and use our physical body is a reflection of who do I think I am? What do I think is real? Where do I think power comes from? Where do I think happiness comes from? What causes suffering? And sometimes when we ourselves are just like, we don't know what's happening, (laughs) if we assume the right posture, a friend of mine who'd made some um, unfortunate mistakes, and in a small community like Ananda, we have no secrets. So one of the things one has to get used to is that everybody knows your business. But it's a loving family. That's, that's the comfort. It's a very loving family, a very forgiving family. So my friend had done some things that were embarrassing, and everyone knew it. And he, was, he sort of was hovering in, in my house, you know, just sort of not knowing what to do next. I said, pull your shoulders back, lift up your heart, raise your eyes, look people right in the eye, don't flinch. I said, in 24 hours, no one will even be thinking about it. All they'll be thinking is, wow, look at him. Look how well he's gone through this. But even as we were talking, his shoulders were pulled forward. He was trying to protect his heart. He was having a hard time looking up. So take take what you can do. And because if you... Um, if you assume a right attitude and a right consciousness, see, the thing about the body also is it not only reflects the consciousness, it can create it. That's the whole practice of yoga postures, we, the way Swami teaches it. We assume a yoga posture, then we add the affirmation that goes with it, and then we become that truth. First we affirm it, but then we become it. And we become it also because it feels good. Because right attitude, right posture, right expression um, makes us happy. So watch yourself and, you know, pay attention. It's a fascinating practice, actually, to just sort of see, oh, I'm noticing where my mind is. Where is my body? And if I don't like where my mind is and I see the reflection of that in my body, then let me change my body. Let me, above all, Above all, lift my heart up toward the light. Lift your heart up toward the light, and everything else will follow. God bless you.